It's such a, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to welcome all of you here tonight for Law Day. Uh, I want to begin by extending some thanks uh, to, well, to all of you for being here, of course, who are here to celebrate our marvelous awardees. But I want to also thank our Law Day committee uh, and to our sponsors, especially our lead sponsors, Kirkland and Ellis, Latham and Watkins, and Holland and Knight. So thank you all for their support tonight. I also want to extend a special thanks to our co-chairs, Michael Fee, Law Class of 1984, and Jim McDermott, Law Class of 1980. You both put your heart and soul into making this event the best ever, and thank you for all that you've done. Uh, now their success builds on the incredible work of some former Law Day chairs who are with us this evening, Mark Warner, class of 1989, Tom Burton, class of 1996, and John Hanafy, class of 1974. So each year the Boston College Law School community comes together to celebrate our Law Day dinner with friends, colleagues, faculty, and uh, for many, including myself, this is one of the highlights of the spring. However, we really should not forget that Law Day is also uh, more than a social gathering. It's a celebration of the rule of law, and it's meant to be a point of reflection on the role law played in the foundations of our country and to recognize its continued importance for society. Now, many of you know that Law Day is celebrated on May 1st, and was begun by President Eisenhower in 1958. And at that time, he said, quote, the world no longer has a choice between force and law, and if civilization is to survive, it must choose the, role, the rule of law, unquote. As I look at our Law Day honorees tonight, I can think of no better advocates for or representatives of the sanctity of the rule of law. There are many, many complex problems facing our world today. I just myself returned from spending a week in Uzbekistan, uh, and it's a place that uh, is trying to establish the rule of law. So uh, when we think about uh, tonight and how the rule of law has been established here in the US and supported, think of the many people who are only beginning to experience what we've known and held so dear for so long. It provides a foundation to help us navigate the complexity uh, that our legal system has in order to seek justice for all people. And as lawyers and negotiate, negotiators and thought leaders, it's our duty to strengthen our communities and support the common good by applying the skills we've acquired uh, in our profession. So we look to people like those being honored here tonight to lead us in those efforts. They've given of themselves through their words and actions with the goal of giving voice to those who do not have one and to utilizing law to create a more just society. It's this core vision we strive to instill in our students and hold so dear at Boston College Law School. To the Law Day honorees, thank you for all that you have done to further these ideals and to help make our world a better place. So before continuing uh, tonight's awards, it's my great pleasure to invite Michael Puzo, member of the class of 1977, to uh, join me in singing America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of green, for purple mountain majesties, Above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea, O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern impact 
passion distress, a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thy every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty And now may I invite Father Frank Herman to the podium to give the invocation. Let us bow our heads for a moment in prayer. The Psalms tell us, Lord, that you desire to give justice to the weak and the fatherless to maintain the rights of the afflicted and the destitute, to rescue the needy, to have compassion upon aliens and the vulnerable, and to be caring stewards of your creation. The prophets tell us that when we take part in your mission of justice, our faces shine with your light and that our light will shine forth for the world. We give you thanks, Lord, for those whom we celebrate this evening. Their decades of dedication to justice shine out in our community, inspiring and encouraging each one of us and the people they have served. We, we pray your blessing on those whom we honor and upon us and all members of the Boston College Law School community. May your face shed its light on us all. Prosper our future as you have sustained us in our past. Help us always to use the instrument of law to bring forth an ever more abundant harvest of justice throughout our community, our nation, and our world. Finally, bless our companionship and friendship this evening. These prayers we make to you, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Are we going to uh, continue with our program? And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our Law Day co-chairs. As I mentioned earlier, our co-chairs of the event this year are Michael Fee and Jim McDermott. Uh, Jim McDermott, class of 1980, Michael Fee, class of 1984, and they've led the group through harrowing discussions and heated debates about who in our legal community should be honored this year. Both bring a great deal of charm and wit to their roles, and they bring skills they've mastered on negotiation tables and in courtrooms, and the competition for potential honor honorees, as you can imagine, was fierce. Uh, and you can rest assured that they are honoring a truly remarkable state, slate tonight. Uh, now, Jim and Michael have the most rewarding part of this evening in this role. They actually get to confer our, the, our awardees and give them uh, their awards. Um, so before uh, turning the event over to them, I want to extend my deep personal gratitude to them both uh, for their service and for their dedication. And I also want to thank all of the members of the Law Day Committee. So if you are here tonight and a member of the Law Day Committee, would you please rise so we can recognize you. Thank you all, and uh, now I'll turn the podium over to Michael.
Good evening. Thank you, Dean Rougeau. And welcome, everyone, uh, to the 2019 Boston College Law Day Dinner. Um, it is a, a true pleasure uh, to have served as co-chair uh, last year with Tom Burton uh, and this year with Jim McDermott. Uh, and to, as the dean mentioned, uh, assemble with the help of a very dedicated committee uh, a, a slate of honorees that we, uh, of which we are very, very proud, each one of them. Uh, more about them uh, later. Um, I'd like to thank the committee, and I'd also like to thank the law school's professional staff who have been instrumental in helping us uh, not only work our way through the process, which began last year, shortly after last year's Law Day dinner, uh, and, uh, and continued right up and through this uh, dinner. Um, like many of you, um, I've chosen to be engaged with uh, Boston College Law School as an alum uh, because it is um, very rewarding. Uh, it's rewarding to see the great heights to which the law school has now ascended, uh, the types of students that come out of the law school, uh, the faculty that the law school uh, continues to attract. Uh, and so for a variety of reasons, um, I and my wife and I have been uh, very supportive of the law school over the years. Um, we do a number of different things, but uh, one of the things we do, of course, is I do, is that I make sure that Latham and Watkins um, assembles breath mints and other merchandise for Professor Hillinger's first year survival kits. Um, and that is, uh, that is something that is unique to Ingrid and um, when she calls, you just do not turn her down. Um, I know many of you here tonight also support the law school uh, through your financial contributions and through your contributions of your expertise as alumni uh, and uh, have participated in law school programs, whether those programs are mock trial programs, negotiation workshops, serving as advisors to students. Um, I have found that uh, to be uh, incredibly rewarding in its own right. Um, I participated one year in the um, mock interview program where we uh, tried to uh, uh, help uh, students get ready for the interview process. Uh, and through that mock interview, I met Lauren Hedaris, who's sitting at my table tonight. She's an associate at Latham and Watkins. Um, and it all started through a mock interview program that we did uh, well in advance of on-campus recruiting. So the rewards are uh, just a terrific, terrific uh, you know, experience uh, when you get involved with the law school. BC Law School, I might add, is a very special place. Um, it's a place that uh, does not simply process students for three years and render them eligible to take the bar exam. Um, our law school has, from its start in 1929, um, always had a mission that separates itself from its peer schools. That mission is currently summarized very well on the school's website, which reads as follows. In part, with an impressive record of education, scholarship, and activity in social justice and public service, BC Law continues to prepare students not only to be good lawyers, but to lead good lives. That is a very concise and accurate description of our law school. It's the way I perceived the law school when I was there uh, many years ago, and it's the way I perceived the law school when I visit to this day. Um, I would again thank you for all of your support for Boston College Law School. Uh, and I would encourage you to continue your support for Boston College Law School. Uh, get involved, visit the school, see what it's doing. Now, this night is very special because it not only offers us an opportunity to honor some distinguished alumni, uh, but it also offers us the opportunity to get together as a law school community. And uh, it is, at its heart, an opportunity for us to raise some funds for scholarships for Boston College Law School students. Um, scholarships are critically important these days. Uh, the costs of graduate education, law school education, uh, have increased mightily. Uh, financial aid, um, uh, not too long ago, was not really even a factor if one went to law school. Today, it's essential. If we're going to assemble a class and send out into the world individuals who represent the various walks of life, the various socioeconomic strata um, that have always been the target population for Boston College Law School dating back to the 20s when it served an, a community primarily of immigrants. 
So in keeping with that, uh, that objective, um, we have used this event to raise money and been very successful at raising money. Last year, for the first time ever, we were able to raise enough money for four Law Day scholarships out of this event. And we are very proud of that. And I am pleased to say that the four Law Day scholars uh, who have benefited from your generosity and your predecessor's generosity last year um, are with us here today. They are all from the class of 2021. And I'd like to introduce them and have them stand and be embarrassed for just a moment. They are Joe Schlemeyer, Samuel Miano, Jacob Lang, and Nicholas Coppola. And it gives me great pleasure to announce that thanks to your generous support uh, and this outstanding community that we have, uh, we were once again able to match that goal of uh, funding four Law Day Scholars as a result of the efforts that have led to this dinner and all of your generosity. Thank you very much. So Law Day uh, serves multiple purposes and it does pave the way for us to launch a new generation of lawyers into the world. Some people outside this room might be horrified by that. But we know how important it is. We know that it's lawyers who provide the pro bono representation. We know that it's lawyers who enter careers in public service. We know that it's lawyers uh, who have the obligation, uh, the professional obligation, uh, to care for those uh, who need it most. Um, I really question whether there are other professions that have those same uh, obligations or discharge them so well as lawyers. Uh, so as we think about launching this new generation of lawyers, I'm reminded of uh, some words that a, a lawyer told me when I was in law school, which was that there are a lot of lawyers, but never enough good ones. And I think Boston College Law School sends out good ones. So uh, kudos to the faculty, to the dean, uh, for what they do. The first award tonight, it's, I'm a, very pleased to announce, uh, is the reward that recognizes outstanding achievements of a relatively recent graduate of the law school. And it's my pleasure tonight to present the recent graduate award to Esther Adetunji, class of 2011. <laughs> Esther graduated from Boston College Law School in 2011, and in 2012, she joined Bread for the City, a nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C. that helps low-income D.C. residents by providing food, clothing, medical care, and legal and social services in order to reduce the burdens on these individuals as a result of poverty. As the supervising attorney for Bread for the City, Esther focuses on ensuring her clients have safe, habitable, and affordable housing. Esther's professional journey in public interest began decades ago when she realized how political and social power can severely impact vulnerable, vulnerable groups and individuals. While attending Boston College Law School, she was one of 10 students selected to participate in BC Law's first ever human rights externship. In this program, she spent a semester in South Africa where she served as a legal intern for a nonprofit organization, advising and advocating for the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. This life-changing opportunity sparked her interest in working with underserved communities. In her spare time, Esther sits on the steering committee for the DC Bars litigation community and is head of the Department of Young Adult and Youth Ministry at her church. It goes without saying that only since 2011, Esther has become an inspiration to Boston College Law students and recent graduates, and I am proud to present her with the 2019 Recent Graduate Award.
All right. I was really nervous when they told me I had to make a speech, but here it goes. Um, I would like to thank Boston College Law School. I would like to thank the nomination committee and everyone who played a role in me receiving this award tonight, so thank you very much. I am honored to be in the same category, in the same room as my fellow distinguished honorees, and that in and of itself is an award, so thank you. I would also like to thank my family and friends who are here tonight to support me. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am a product of the small world around me. It started with my parents laying a strong foundation that easily fostered a desire to serve. It was that foundation that led me on a journey and a dream of becoming a lawyer, and specifically attending BC Law. What I love and found really unique about BC Law was that no matter your reason for attending law school, there was a place for you at BC Law. Somehow, BC Law managed to provide the right amount of community inspiration and encouragement that allowed me to strive for and truly achieve my dreams. I credit BC Law's professors, many of whom are here today, um, the administration, and the dynamic group of students who are admitted into the law school every year. I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by some of the best people I have met thus far in my life, and I will always be grateful for that. I went to law school with like many young aspiring attorneys with the naive desire to change the world. I say naive not because I think changing the world is an impossible task. After all, if not us, who is left to change the world and make it the best world that works best for everyone everywhere? Rather, I say naive because at that time, I lacked a true understanding of what it would take and what it would cost to actually change the world. Now I know and can see that every act of goodness, of kindness, of service, of diligence in doing what we've been called to do, whether in our professional or our personal lives, um, act of lending a hand, behaving fairly in our interaction with others, and for those in positions of authority, in using that authority in a way that benefits everyone that comes in contact with them, that these are in fact the ways that we can and do change the world every day. These are the ways that we can make an impact and create positive ripple effects in our communities, in our businesses, in our society, in our lives, in our own lives, and in the lives of those around us. I believe this is how we make a difference and in fact accomplish the seemingly impossible task of changing the world. So I say let's be daring, let's be bold, let's be ambitious and strive to change the world. Thank you. So that's one down, and the committee, I think, did a great job. So uh, thank you, Esther, and congratulations, and thank you for everything that, that you do. Um, our program continues uh, uninterrupted. I'd now like to call on um, our, my co-chair, uh, Jim McDermott, uh, to continue the award presentations. Jim. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to serve as the co-chair, although that's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, Mike really led the committee, and my job was simply to say yes to whatever he proposed. Um, <laughs> but I also, uh, I want to echo what Mike said. I really want to thank the law school staff. You guys are great. You made this job pretty easy for us to do. Um, and the size of the crowd here tonight and the amount of money we raised is a testament to you all, your hard work. So thank you all to the staff. Um, the next award um, is the Honorable David S. Nelson Public Interest Law Award, which recognizes a graduate of Boston College Law School who has made a noteworthy contribution in public interest law. I am pleased to announce that this year's Nelson Award will go to Jennifer Smith. <laughs> Je Jennifer is a graduate of the class of 1998. She has spent her entire career expanding and creating access to justice for criminal and juvenile defendants across the globe. Over the past two decades, Jennifer has worked on legal aid reform in a number of countries in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. She is regularly called upon as an expert by the United Nations, governments, and organizations around the world. In her first semester at BC Law School, Jennifer received a grant from the BC Law Holocaust and Human Rights Project to work in Cambodia with new lawyers. She also participated in the Juvenile Rights Advocacy Program, the Immigration Clinic, and then took a one-year leave of absence to work in the public defender's office in Cambodia. After law school, Jennifer worked as a public defender with the Massachusetts Committee for Public Counsel Services, 
founding their Immigration Impact Unit, and then served as a public defender in New York for the Legal Aid Society. That's just the beginning. Um, before joining the International Legal Foundation, uh, where she works now, Jennifer lived in China for five years, where she ran the China Defender Program of International Bridges to Justice. Jennifer now serves as the Executive Director of the International Legal Foundation, the leading global advocate for the right to legal representation for those accused of a crime. At the ILF, Jennifer has spearheaded efforts to strengthen international support for the right to quality legal representation for poor persons accused of crimes. She played a key role in drafting the United Nations principles and guidelines on access to legal aid in criminal justice systems, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly in December 2012. She was also the driving force behind the biennial International Conference on Access to Legal Aid in Criminal Justice Systems, the inaugural event of which was held in South Africa in, in 2014. Uh, in the words of my friend and classmate Francine Sherman, clinical professor and director of the Juvenile Rights Advocacy Program at BC, Jennifer is a brilliant, tireless, and fearless advocate. She is a genuine pioneer working with local attorneys and emerging governments to guarantee quality legal representation to all adults and juveniles charged with crimes. In this work, she is the best sort of ambassador for the culture of social justice and excellence that we cultivate at Boston College Law School. As Dean Rougeau speaks about the idea of justice for all, I can think of no better person to receive this award. Please join me in congratulating Jennifer Smith, this year's recipient of the David S. Dalton Public Interest Law Award. Thank you so much. This is such a huge honor. Um, I'm so incredibly grateful to be here. Thank you to Boston College Law School, to the committee for nominating me for this incredible honor, um, to the wonderful, wonderful professors um, who I know were behind this effort too. I think one of the great things about Boston College Law School, and we talked about the commitment to social justice and public interest, that's really what brought me to the law school. Um, but it's really, um, you know, in their hearts and in their spirits, and since I came to this law school, um, they did so much to push me to succeed, um, to champion me, and to open doors, and, and I could not be more grateful for that because that has really changed um, my life and, and, and really opened doors for, for what's possible for lawyers to do, not only here in the United States, but around the world. Um, as was mentioned, you know, my, my first year of law school, I came to law school wanting to, to change the world, to, to, to work in public interest, and um, I, I really um, was, felt challenged my first year. You know, you, you kind of work on the nuts and bolts and people are talking about law firms, and, and that wasn't why I came to law school. And the Career Services Office worked hard to, to really find these opportunities and found one in Cambodia. And at the time, the Khmer Rouge were still in power, right? There were only 20 lawyers in the whole country. Um, um, but they said, you know, you should do this. this. This looks like a great opportunity. So I went. I was telling the dean, I don't, I don't think they made me sign any waivers. <laughs> I were like, just go. Um, and uh, it was amazing. And, you know, when I came back to the law school and said, I don't think, you know, a semester's enough. I want to go longer. I want to stay for a whole year. They could not have been more supportive. Um, I didn't even know you could do, you could do that, <laughs> but it's true. You can actually uh, take more time to graduate law school. So I was incredibly grateful for the support to do that um, and, and, the, and the opening that provided to really understand you know, how important lawyers are. We heard about that to establishing a rule of law and we take that for granted a bit here in the United States. We have of course enormous challenges um, in our criminal justice system but around the world in the countries where I work most people if you're poor, if you're marginalized, you're not going to get a lawyer. Okay, and you're going to be dragged, you're going to be arrested, um, you're going to spend months, years in detention, um, often not see a judge, um, not have evidence against you when you go into court. And so this is something that we've really been trying to rev revolutionize, you know, how important it is to have a lawyer, um, for particularly for the poor and marginalized. Um, 
increasingly we see, and I'm so, so proud to work at the International Legal Foundation alongside really brave women and men working on the front lines in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Myanmar, in many more countries around the world where increasingly authoritarian regimes are cracking down um, on rule of law and, and efforts of lawyers to, to work on behalf of those who are defenseless, where increasingly children, women, and men are arrested not for what they've done, but for who they are, for what they say, for what they think, for who they love. Um, and so these efforts to really give lawyers the skills to fight against these oppressive regimes to ensure that the courts are ensuring justice is so meaningful um, and there's so much that we can do to support these efforts. So I'm, I'm honored to work alongside them and grateful for the tools that Boston College Law School has given me to do that. Um, I want to thank you know, all the professors here who've supported me. Thank you, Professor Sherman, um, Professor Borden, Professor Berry, who, who are here, who gave me the tools and have continued to support me. Um, Professor Sherman actually went to Palestine. She's been helping us on, on issues of juvenile justice, so it's great because um, they've stayed involved and, and we continue to look for them to, to help us in the work that we're doing. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank um, you know, two people who are here today with me and, and two who are not. My mother, um, who's been telling everyone that she's the reason that I'm here, <laughs> rightfully so, and it's true. She taught me that um, I, could, I could do anything and has supported me, which was no small task because when I was in Cambodia, I was only 22, there was a coup, um, and she was watching it on CNN, the tanks going down the street, so the fact that um, she's continued to support me in doing this work, uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful. Um, and my husband, um, and my two young boys who are not here, but my husband is, and without uh, their support and, and their sacrifice and their love, I would not be able to do this work. So thank you, um, and thank you all. I'm so grateful, um, and uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, I think you can sense um, Jennifer's passion that we made a great choice this year. The next award is the Daniel G. Holland Lifetime Achievement Award, which recognizes a member of the alumni community who has, over the course of his or her lifetime, made significant contributions to the law school and to the community. I'm pleased to announce that this year's Lifetime Achievement Award goes to the Honorable Dennis P. Cohen, Class of 1976. Judge Cohen had spent his entire professional career in service to and upholding the rule of law while simultaneously serving his alma mater and his community. Judge Cohen served as an assistant district attorney in Philadelphia for 24 years. He was appointed to the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas, which is the top level trial court in Pennsylvania by Governor Tom Ridge in 2000, was elected in 2001 and reelected in 2011. Judge Cohen currently presides in the Civil Trial Division and has previously served in the Criminal and the Family Courts. Beginning in 2016, Judge Cohen has been a team leader for the major jury civil cases in Philadelphia, where he was responsible for overseeing all cases filed in 2016 and before. Judge Cohen is the co-chair of the First Judicial District Civil Conversations Program, which is a judicial educational program, and previously served as co-chair of the First Judicial District's Criminal Conversations Program from 2006 to 2015. In addition, throughout his career, Judge Cohen has been a champion for Boston College Law School in a number of ways. He has hired over 20 BC Law graduates as his judicial law clerks. In 2012, he eliminated an administrative position on, on his three-person staff in order to simultaneously create two law clerk positions and give more opportunities for recent law school graduates. Judge Cohen flies to Boston every year to interview third-year students uh, from BC for his law clerk positions. In 1996, he was a founding member of the Philadelphia chapter of the BC Law Alumni Association, where he served as president and vice president. During his tenure, he created the chapter's Father Drinan Award. Dennis also served on the BC Law Board of Overseers starting in 2009 and was elected president of the Boston College Law School Alumni Association in 2010. 
He has served as a member of the Alumni Board until 2017. Judge Cohen has also been active for the last 31 years with the Philadelphia Bar Association and has served on its Board of Governors and as co-chair of the Professional Responsibility Committee, the Judicial Selection Committee, and the chair of the Criminal Justice Section. In addition to all of these professional accomplishments, he's served his community in a number of ways. He's been vice president of the Mainline Reform Temple. He serves on the board of managers for the Central High School Alumni Association. He's president of Overbrook Farms, a uh, neighborhood civil association. Serves on the board of trustees for the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia and is vice president of the Jewish Community Relations Council. I'm humbled to present the Daniel G. Holland Lifetime Achievement Award to the Honorable Dennis P. Cohen. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Dean, the, all the members of the Law Day Committee, fellow awardees, and the esteemed members of the uh, law, BC Law community. And I will take judicial notice that everybody here is an esteemed member of the BC Law alumni community. So I'm deeply honored to receive the Daniel G. Holland Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and what I'm about to say about BC, it's a love story. So we can call this BC and me, me and BC. But before I go any further and get myself in trouble, I just wanna ask my wife, who's right there, to stand up. This is my wife, Pam, and here's why I'm asking her. Pam, no matter how much I love BC, and you know it's a lot, I love you and the family more. That should now clear me. <laughs> so I want to thank Dean Paul Kane. He is a past recipient of this Holland Lifetime Achievement Award. When I was an impressionable young undergraduate, he came to my school and met with me and others in a small group. Until then, I knew very little about BC, except we all knew about Father Drynan. Dean Kane was so impressive that he made the critical difference for me. Were it not for Dean Kane, I would have never gone to BC. So Dean, thank you very much. So as I mentioned, I love going to BC. We have a brilliant and caring world-class faculty, great student colleagues, some of whom are here today. And in my entire third year, I felt sentimental about leaving BC Law. One of my singular joys was participating in the Grimes Moot Court competition my second year and serving on the board of student advisors on my third. This was coached by my fabulous federal courts professor, Tom Carey. So a little snippet about the benefit of Grimes. Less than nine months after graduation, I was very lucky to make my first appellate argument as an assistant district attorney in Philadelphia before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which in Pennsylvania is the top court in the land. Thanks to my Grimes experience, I had a blast making the argument. Adding to my pleasure, opposing counsel, now this is in Philadelphia, opposing counsel was the father of one of my law school roommates. <laughs> and my dad, who's a lawyer, was sitting in the back of the audience. Every time the Chief Justice would try to tear apart one of my arguments, and he tried many times, the Chief would then wink at my dad. <laughs> in the 1980s, every two years, Dean Coquillette would come to Philly to have a lunch with the alumni. We loved getting together so much with the dean that after a number of these luncheons, we decided to create our own chapter. So thanks to Dean Cocolette. In the 1990s, 
after some convincing of the BC Law Alumni Council, the Philadelphia chapter created the Father Drinan Award in order to put BC Law on the map in Philadelphia. Father Drinan came to Philadelphia to receive the very first award. Now, coincidentally, the timing was perfect. The event was during the Clinton impeachment era, and Father Drinan was in great demand nationally. And why was that the case? Because when he was a congressman on the House Judiciary Committee, he was actively involved on the Nixon impeachment issues. This ceremony was covered by Philadelphia Television. And thanks to Linda Glennon, then Director of Alumni Relations, I became involved with the Alumni Council. After this evolved into the Alumni Board, I worked with Christine Kelly, uh, who was masterful as Director of Alumni Relations for many years. So thank you, Christine. As we all know, she's also a graduate of law school. In fact, she's a double eagle. And the award, by the way, named after Daniel G. Holland, he was a triple eagle. So um, it was a joy also for me to work closely with exemplary presidents of the Alumni Council and our Alumni Board, such as Maureen Curran, Brian Falvey, Walter Sullivan, Kevin Curtin, John Hanafy, Tom Burton, Ellen Kearns, and George Field. And George himself is a past winner of this Lifetime Achievement Award. And it was an honor, as Jim had mentioned, uh, for me to become president of this association. Now, after I was appointed judge in 2000 by the Pennsylvania governor, no one knew when and if the state senate would approve. That's the process in Pennsylvania. The president, uh, the governor appoints, but a uh, governor nominates, but the state senate has to approve. So I did not know when I would, need a, when I would start and when I need a law clerk. So what did I do? I called up Gene French, who at that time was the director of career services. And I said to Gene, Gene, is there anyone who recently graduated BC Law that you could recommend? What'd she say? Gabe DeVito, she immediately said. He was really smart and really good. She promised, and he was. So that began the process. And as Jim had mentioned, I've now hired 20 BC law clerks. But my thank you goes to career services of this law school and the BC professors for provi providing me with outstanding law clerks that make a huge difference in the quality of my chambers. And they've all felt like family to me. So this year, it's a recently graduated Anna Sanders and Matthew DeFernando, who are both outstanding. Last year, it was the extraordinary team of Katie Vickers and Mal Mazurik. Now, I think Katie and Mal are both here. They can stand. Now, also, I'm very fortunate that a law clerk from seven years ago showed up today who did a great job for me. That's Brendan Boyle. Brendan? Thank you. Now, as Jim mentioned, to interview the prospective applicants, I fly to BC every year. Uh, and when I'm in BC, I also really like to see professors. So I've seen my own great professor of administrative law who's still teaching at this law school, even though it was at least a few years ago that I went here. And that is George Brown. George. George, George is no, thank you, George. He no longer obviously teaches administrative law. He's well beyond that. But if you have national security questions, he's the expert. Uh, but I like to see, I really like to see George. We get together every time. We already talked about September. I also like to see my professor friends that I've gained from this millennium, from the beginning of this millennium. George 
Brown, well, that was from the 1970s, believe it or not. Um, so uh, I just want to mention a few of the people I really love to see. Ingrid Hillinger, Bob Bloom. I just asked them to stand up while I mention them. Uh, Mark Grodin, Jim Rapetti, and many others. So I have to confess with all of you here that seeing so many wonderful BC professors when I come up to BC every year makes the whole trip worth it. I feel so fulfilled seeing them. Now also, obviously I get the great pleasure and thrill of meeting so many dynamic 3Ls. So it is one of the highlights of my year. And again, thank you all very much. Thank you, Judge. You know, it, it, it's easy for guys like Mike and me and the rest of us that live in Boston to be supportive of the law school. But people like uh, Dennis who don't live in Boston, who put that extra effort in, is really what makes the law school a, a special place and really makes it truly a national university. The next award that I have the pleasure to present is the William J. Keneally Alumnus of the Year Award. And I am proud to present this award to the Honorable Michael E. Capuano, class of 1977. <laughs> Congressman Capuano has spent his entire career serving the people of Massachusetts. After graduating from Somerville High School and then Dartmouth College, Mike joined the class of 1977 at Boston College Law School. While he was in law school, he did a work study program at the Massachusetts State House, and upon graduation, he started working as the legal counsel to the legislature's Joint Committee on Taxation and served as a part-time ward alderman in Somerville. After leaving the State House to focus on tax law and government affairs, Mike was elected an alderman at large and then ran successfully for the mayor of Somerville. As mayor, he led the efforts to revitalize Somerville and help transform his city into the great place it is today to live and work. In 1999, Mike ran for Congress in the 7th Congressional District of Massachusetts and was elected. He served for 10 terms um, in that seat. Uh, I was proud that say that I was a constituent for most of those 20 years of Mike's. In Congress, he served on the Financial Services Committee and on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, becoming a senior member of both. He also served on the Ethics, House Administration, Science, and Budget Committees. He was appointed to chair a special task force on ethics enforcement, which resulted in the establishment of the Office of Congressional Ethics. Congressman Capuano achieved numerous legislative successes over his career. I'll just list a few examples here. As a member of the Transportation Committee, he successfully protected the state share of federal transportation dollars, and in 2012, his measure establishing a nationwide tunnel safety inspection program became law. Moved by the story of a young man forced out of school and into hiding after telling authorities of a crime he had witnessed, Congressman Capuano filed the Young Witness Assistance Act to create a grant program at the Department of Justice for locally developed juvenile witnesses assistance initiatives. He also succeeded in passing a law to require Medicare coverage for vision rehabilitation services, helping to restore safety and independence to seniors who suffer from vision loss. That's just an example of the wide variety of areas that Mike had influence. Congressman Capuano also co-founded and co-chaired the Congressional Caucus on the Sudan and South Sudan. He emerged as a leading congressional voice, traveling to the region, securing $50 million for peacekeepers, and advocating for a strong response to the humanitarian crises there. He worked with his colleagues to end the violence and suffering, pushing for an arms embargo, and worked to avert the famine with adequate human relief. For his work for the city of Somerville, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and service as a member of the United States House of Representatives, Congressman Capuano truly embodies the Jesuit tradition of men and women for others. He has been a loyal and supportive member of the BC law community throughout his career. I'm very honored to present the William J. Keneally Alumnus of the Year Award to him tonight. Please join me in congratulating Congressman Michael E. Capuano.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have no idea what I'm doing up here with people who are saving the world. <laughs> They're doing God's work. When they first called me to tell me about this, I said, hey, are you nuts? <laughs> this is just a kid who made a few choices, got a little lucky once in a while, worked hard like everybody else. And, of course, lived a little bit of a public life because of it. But I don't think I did anything that anybody here wouldn't have done. And I'm really glad that you mentioned the, the Jesuit tradition, because I really think it has a lot to do with how I think of the world. In the sense that, why? Why do we do these things? We do these things for exactly the reason the two speakers already said, that we're trying to improve the world. We're trying to make the world a better place to live. And for me, I will tell you that in my career, I've always expected more from lawyers. And I know that's probably not fair, but I think that, let's be honest, you're the most intelligent people in society. <laughs> and it's not because of any other reason than God gave you a brain. He gave you the ability to grow up in this country, to go to a law school like this, and to use it, had you been born in the countries from which your families came, you probably wouldn't have had those opportunities. You were lucky. You won the genetic lottery. And you used it. You all work hard. But because of that, because with a few different choices in your family's history, or maybe if you weren't quite fast enough to get away from the police in junior high, <laughs> life would have been different. But because you've made it, I actually think you owe something to society. To be successful, but to give back. To stand up when people who can't stand up for themselves need help. And so many of you do with all the jokes about being lawyers and all that goes along, it's just not right. It's just not right. There are so many people in this room that are giving back to society, it's amazing. And I appreciate the award, but I don't see anything I did as anything different. By the way, I'm now making the transition. I'm kind of doing a little bit of private practice. I need a little help. Who do I bill this to? <laughs> I'm actually now doing all the things I've done all my life for free, and I'm trying to figure out how much I should charge for it. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the hell you guys have been doing all this time. But I really just want to say thank you for being the best of society. Thank you for standing up for the little guy. And thank you for helping me. I will tell you, particularly in my class, it's kind of funny, I'm looking at these kids who were here. And there's so many people in my class, first of all, I gotta be honest, I was probably the dumbest guy in my class. I struggled to keep up with these people. Now, I was pretty good at the time at a couple of things. I organized the basketball games down at the hut. I did okay at that. And I did really, really well at bar review. <laughs> We still doing that, Dean? Uh, <laughs> Lenny's saying yes. All right. Okay. But the rest was a struggle for me because I just wasn't that focused. And the truth is, you heard it, it's the truth. My career was decided, was set, I didn't know it at the time, because of a work-study program. Like lots of kids, I didn't have the money, or my family had the money to go to college and law school, we had to do work study. My wife was in graduate school, and by the way, I want to be real clear, there is no way in hell I would have gotten through law school if I wasn't married. <laughs> My wife is a lot more earnest than me, and she made me study as much as anybody could. And it got me through. But that work study program, it provided me the opportunity to go to law school, but it also opened up a door to a career that I never really saw. I didn't know what I was gonna do in law school. Honestly, I, 
I wasn't the guy who came, oh, I have this dream of being a lawyer. I didn't know any lawyers. And if I did, they were probably, you know, two-bit criminal justice guys taking care of my friends on the other <laughs> end. <laughs> so I didn't have this dream of, you know, oh, the law, or it's this wonderful thing. I was just kind of putting one foot in front of the other, trying to figure out what to do. And all of a sudden, this came along. And I liked it. And I was good at it, and I saw an opportunity to help change the world. And I pursued it, and I got lucky. Let's be honest, a lot of it was luck. So I want to thank the BC community for doing all kinds of wonderful things for me, not the least of which was giving me the opportunity to be in a room, I won't say for the first time in my life, but the first time in my life for three years with everybody in the room being more intelligent than me. <laughs> it was a great feeling to be able to listen to people and respect all of their opinions, to understand that if they thought that maybe I was wrong or maybe I was right and I got lucky. It was a fantastic opportunity that is getting more and more difficult for kids from my background to achieve. That's why tonight is so important, things like this. I'm now into the private sector. I'll be making more donations, Dean, don't worry. <laughs> Public life, you don't get to do that so much. But what you've done for four students tonight is, is amazing. You're giving people an opportunity that might not otherwise have it, yet might contribute greatly to the next generation. That's something. That's something special. And so I want to say thank you for that. I want to say thank you particularly to my classmates who are here. I can't tell you how supportive and friendly they've been over the years. It's, it's a refreshing thing to be able to see them and bust their chops and have fun and not drink as much as we used to, but, you know, <laughs> that's old age. I want to thank you. And I really, I can't tell you how much I want to thank for the recognition, but for helping bring together, everybody who goes to law school is smart. I was a smart kid, I'm an intelligent guy. Your intelligence unfocused is wasted. BC provided me the opportunity to focus those abilities and to do something with them. Thank you for that. Thank you for your support of BC. Thank you for your friendship of me and my family over these many years. And I want to thank you for the next generation. And right now, particularly with what's going on in Washington, I want to thank you for your leadership on that rule of law. As I said, I do hold lawyers in my mind and my heart to a higher standard. You do have an obligation to stand up, and even if we disagree as to what the law should be, that's fine. But to remain silent, when you know better, it's not just a crime, it's a sin. Most of you don't. And I know it's touchy in private practice, you don't want to get any clients upset. But when the time comes, that our national leaders, in your mind, in your heart, wherever that might be, have crossed that line, there is an obligation, an obligation to speak out. And I want to be clear, you I'm talking as a person who sued both President Bush and President Obama. And I probably would have sued Trump eventually. <laughs> because there is a line. Again, people can disagree, that's what lawyers get paid for. But don't let your moral compass or your business get lost in your business focus. Thank you very much for the award, thank you for the opportunity, thank you for the recognition. Thank you, Congressman, uh, for those inspiring remarks, and uh, thanks to all of our honorees. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's playoff time. Uh, in basketball, there's a triple-double. In hockey, there's a hat trick. In baseball, there's a grand slam. You've heard from four honorees, um, and I think that's
four runs, I think that qualifies as a grand slam. So thank you to all our honorees who have been honored tonight. Well, I don't know what the term is, but if there's anything higher than a grand slam, it's probably Ellen Huvel. It is my distinct honor to present the final award of the evening, the Thomas More, St. Thomas More Award, to Ellen Huvel. The St. Thomas More Award recognizes an individual who represents the ideals of St. Thomas More. Steadfast in her principles, dignified in the face of adversity, courageous in advocating for what is right and just. The attributes for the Moore Award, and those are the established attributes for the Moore Award that we as a committee have to apply, they could have been written with Ellen Huvel in mind. She is a true trailblazer who has shown dignity and personal toughness in the face of adversity, and through her efforts to promote fairness and equality under law, Judge Huvel plays an indispensable role in advancing the cause of justice and the rule of law. Ellen Siegel Huvel is a senior U.S. District Judge on the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Ellen grew up in Newton, Massachusetts and graduated from Wellesley College. Now, the biography I was supplied with said that she then attended Boston College Law School. I uh, hope you don't mind, Judge Huvel, but I did my own research, which as the associates at the table would tell you is probably very dangerous at this stage in my career. But I found out there's another degree. Judge Huvel has a master in city planning degree from Yale's School of Architecture, 1972. Now, I don't know what happened to her city planning career. I have no idea. But I do know one thing. Somewhere out there, somewhere out there, there's a city less well planned <laughs> because Ellen Huvel didn't jump in and plan it. Immediately following her graduate degree from Yale, uh, Ellen entered Boston College Law School, and she is a member of the raucous class of 1975. They used to be more raucous, but that's raucous now. <laughs> Immediately following law school, Ellen clerked for Chief Justice Edward F. Hennessy of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, and then joined the esteemed Washington, D.C. firm of Williams & Connolly, where, as an associate, she practiced criminal and civil litigation. In 1984, Ellen Huvel became the first woman to be named a partner at Williams & Connolly. In 1990, President George H. W. Bush appointed Ellen as an associate judge on the Superior Court for the District of Columbia, where she served in the civil, criminal, and family divisions. In March 1999, President Bill Clinton appointed Ellen to the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Having been appointed in March, she was confirmed by the U.S. Senate in October of 1999. Since joining the court, she has enjoyed an illustrious career, presiding over both high-profile and more ordinary cases with the same dedication to fairness and justice that has won her acclaim from the local bar. A Washington Post story published in 2015 said in part, quote, during her 16 years as a federal judge, Huvel had built a reputation for moving, moving with machine-like efficiency through her cases. Judge Havel has been appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States to serve on the Judicial Resources Committee from 2002 to 2009. 
the Judicial Conference Committee on Criminal Law from 2011 to 2017, and the Multidistrict Litigation Panel starting in Dece December of 2013 for a seven-year period. In 2017, Judge Uvell was awarded the American Inns of Court Professionalism Award by the DC Circuit. She has taught trial practice at Harvard Law School and at the University of Virginia S School of Law. She gave a week-long seminar in 2010 at Peking University, the School of Transnational Law, and in Shenzhen, China. She spoke on prosecuting public corruption cases in the United States and served as faculty on US, -sponsored, US government sponsored judicial training programs in Tunisia and also again in China. She is a member of the American Law Institute and fittingly enough, given her background, she is a member of the Edward Bennett Williams Inn of Court in Washington, DC. She's married to Jeffrey Huvel, is the mother of two children, Nikki Milberg and Justin Huvel. Judge Havel is a former member of BC Law's Dean's Advisory Board, where I came to know her, and as she has served as also as a member of the Board of Overseers um, <clears throat> at the Boston College Law School and as a BC alumni chapter leader. Despite her demanding role, Judge Havel makes BC Law a priority as a volunteer and in her philanthropy. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more honored than to present to today's 2019 St. Thomas More Award to the Honorable Ellen Siegel Huvel, class of 75. We forgot to tell Mike that this was part of it. The, uh, thank you very much for Being your kind remarks. Being from Washington, D.C., Judge Havel wanted a teleprompter set up. Yeah, right, right. We they, just uh, couldn't afford it. They, uh, I think Mike got his speaking skills for being trained at the Department of Justice in public corruption. They, uh, I thank you very much for your kind remarks. I thank the dean and the selection committee. I appreciate your nominating me for this wonderful award. I also wish to thank my law school classmates, the class of 75, who are here. Many of them came and contributed, and I appreciate that greatly. <laughs> See, they're more raucous than you expected. Yeah. They, uh, I also want to thank the members of my family who are here, they, uh, and those who have made contributions to make these scholarships possible. I am pleased to be in a distinguished group of people who got awards this evening. They really are truly inspiring. Everybody who came before me, as I sat and listened, I was worried about being the uh, batter at the end of this wonderful performance. I'm also very happy to be in a list of recipients of this award that included uh, Chief Judge Edward Hennessy. As many of you know, he was the Chief Judge of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. And I clerked for him when I got out of law school, as did Mike Cassidy, who teaches here at BC, Renee Landers, and Tom Maffey. Both Tom and Renee are here somewhere. But he had wonderful law clerks, and he was a great mentor. Uh, I also uh, want to say about my years at BC, it was a very special time for me. Boston College Law, law School has been very close to me and my family for years. My brother taught there, my father taught there, my son went to college there, and Dean, uh, the, um, excuse me, the, uh, Father Drynan was a very, very old family friend. And for what, for me though, what makes the school special is not the building which changes every few decades or the books, which have probably disappeared by now, but the people, and in particular, the collegiality that characterizes relationships within the school. When I was a law school a law student, the atmosphere at, Mary, at a lot of law schools was cutthroat. BC was different. 
Students worked hard, but they did not seek advantage at the expense of their classmates. Teachers had high expectations, but did not impose them by embarrassing a student. Although law was a serious undertaking, both teachers and students were ready to see its humorous side, and the bar review certainly provided ample opportunity for that. I have been fortunate over the last decade to participate on the law school's board of overseers when John Garvey was dean, and on the dean's advisory council with Vince Rojo. Excuse me. I have been pleased to see that the school continues its dedication to academic excellence, commitment to public service, and it remains a very collegial place. I was touched by the concern of my fellow advisory council members, including Paul uh, Desir, who's here this evening, and my classmates. Five years ago, when I had an unexpected, unwelcome, and a lengthy stay at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital when I fell here in the Boston area. Uh, I was most impressed also by Dean Rougeau's ability throughout the time he's been dean to combine courtesy and humor with a commitment to academic rigor. To receive an award named for Sir Thomas More is truly an honor. My law school class, and this is quite a long time ago, was the last one to actually occupy Sir Thomas More building on the main campus. More importantly, he was an important figure in the history of the rule of law, one of the fundamental tenets of our democracy, and one that appears to me to be under serious attack these days. One writer has stated, to more, the rule of law is a very pragmatic thing. Beyond philosophy and morality, it is not designed to punish bad people or reward good people, but to apply the same rules to all people, whether good or bad. The rule of law is therefore not conditioned on a human being's subjective determination of right or wrong, which of course can vary as often as the king's taste in women. In the movie A Man for All Seasons, Moore's daughter urges him to arrest a bad man. When he responds that there is no law against being a bad man, she argues that being bad violates God's law. Moore, in response, said to her, well, then let God arrest him. <laughs> in our democracy, the rule of law depends on three conditions. First, those in authority must exercise that authority within the constraints of well-established public norms. Second, the public must respect and comply with legal norms and have confidence that legal determinations are based on the equal application of the law. Third, there must be an independent judiciary. I have partic participated, as Mike has told you, in efforts to encourage other countries to use the rule of law and to follow our principles. In seminars for judges in Tunisia, in State Department dialogues with Chinese government officials, and as an instructor in law schools in China. I have also met judges, lawyers, and law students from all over the world when they come to Washington to see how our judicial system operates. The, these experiences have taught me that this country's commitment to the rule of law is very special. Take the independence of the judiciary. In Tunisia, for instance, judges worry that if they displease the government, they will be sent to uh, the border with Algeria in the desert, far from home, to become a judge there. In China, they have what's called telephone justice, which means that the uh, judge gets a telephone call from a party leader making clear what their determination in a case should be. And very, very few countries have life tenure for judges. But we can no longer take the rule of law for granted. For example, where a governor in his last days in office, after losing re-election, enacts laws to diminish the authority of his successor, or where government officials give false reasons for their actions, the rule of law is weakened. It is important that lawyers, including all of you who are here, educate the public against threats to the rule of law. 
I am proud that one of the founders of a group of lawyers who have committed themselves to speak out on behalf of the independence of the judiciary, the press, and our law enforcement institutions is my classmate, John Montgomery, who I believe is also here this evening. There, over there. John, could you stand up? John is on the steering committee of an organization, and they've, uh, last I knew, had about 400 signatures, of, P of a group that seeks to amplify the voices of lawyers in support of the values underlying the rule of law. And finally, I am proud that so many of my colleagues on the federal bench, regardless of which president appointed them, have insisted in their rulings that the government comply with the law. So I thank you, both because of an award in the name of Sir Thomas More is especially meaningful today, but most of all, because it is bestowed by the law school that means so much to me. Thank you very much.